You can be a maiden, you can turn a phrase into a weapon or a drug. You can be the outcast, be the backlash of somebody's lack of love. Or you can start speaking up. Nothing's gonna hurt you the way the words do, and they settle in your skin. Yep, it's only inside, no sunlight, don't let the shadow in. But I wonder what would happen if you say what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I want to see you be brave with what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I want to see you be brave. Two, three, four. Everybody's been there, everybody's been stared down by the enemy. Falling for the fear and dense and disappearing, bow down to the mighty. Don't run, stop holding your tongue. Maybe there's a way out of the cage where you live. Maybe one of these days you can let the light in. Show me how big your brave is. Say what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I want to see you be brave with what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I want to see you be brave. In a sense, your history of silence won't do you any good. Did you think it would? Let your words be anything but empty. Why don't you tell them the truth? Say what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I want to see you be brave with what you want to say and let the words fall out. Honestly, I Welcome everyone, so good to see you here. I'm Jennifer Marshall, I'm the co-founder and executive director of This Is My Brave. This is a pretty, <laughs> thank you. This is a pretty surreal moment for me. Uh, I, being back on this stage in my hometown, I grew up here in the Hershey area, small town USA. Uh, my dad, Dan Kelly, worked for the Hershey company back then, Hershey Foods Corporation, and my mom was a real estate agent and mortgage professional. I danced on this stage more times than I can count with both Hershey School of Dance and One Broadway during my middle and high school years where I met my lifelong friends, many of whom, whom are here tonight in support. Growing up, Hershey was the kind of town, like most small towns, where everyone knew everyone. I imagine it hasn't changed much in that sense. There are certainly benefits to living in a tight-knit community, but it can also feel much like you're living under a microscope, which can be a huge challenge when you're struggling with a mental illness or if you're the parent of a teen dealing with a mental illness. In 1997, I graduated from Hershey High School and got ready to kiss the bubble of Hershey, as my friends and I called it, goodbye, as I made my way to James Madison University for college. I was ready for the real world, or so I thought. Looking back on my high school years and even college, no one talked about mental health. So when my mental illness emerged in early December 2005, when I was 26, in the form of a terrifying manic episode, my family was completely unprepared. My second manic episode happened two weeks later when my husband and I were visiting my family in Florida for the holidays. It was Christmas Day, and my mom and dad were frantically searching through the phone book. It was 2005. <laughs> the internet wasn't the first place people went back then, um, but they were trying to figure out what to do. Plus, they may, may have felt a little bit embarrassed to call friends for help. 
I thought my life was over when I was diagnosed with type 1 bipolar disorder 14 years ago. For me, that rock bottom was the beginning of what eventually would become something beautiful, only I didn't know it at the time. It would get worse before it got better. Back then, isolated and afraid for my future, I wondered if life were worth living at all. I'd go on to experience a year, a horrible year of clinical depression and two more manic episodes uh, with psychosis during the years I was having my children. Twice, I had to be involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital taken from my home in handcuffs by police officers because I didn't want to expose my babies to the medicine. Thankfully, I didn't let my struggle define me. Through blogging, I found recovery and the beauty and power in sharing my story. The National Alliance on Mental Illness reports that 50% of all lifetime mental illnesses develop by age 14 and 75% develop by age 24. Suicide is currently the second leading cause of death among our young people ages 10 to 24. If these statistics don't light a fire in your belly to do something about it and to help change these, these horrible stats, I don't know what will. To share with you how we got to this moment right here, um, my mom and dad actually never canceled their su subscription to the Hummelstown Sun when they moved to Florida and retired because they wanted to stay connected to the community. And as my mom was reading the paper in February of this year, she shared with me that she read an obituary of a young man who was a high school senior who apparently died by suicide. It happens in communities every week in our country. Every day, 3,000 high school age students attempt suicide. My mom and I talked about how maybe I could reach out and see if This Is My Brave could work with the Hershey community to create a high school initiative. Something to show the students they're not alone in these struggles. There is help out there and treatment works and that talking openly about these things is a great place to start. We've launched our high school initiative, our high school pilot program, through the help and support of Christine Drexler, Hershey High School Principal Jeff Smith, and the We Matter Coalition, because we believe we can save lives by shining a light on true, inspiring stories of recovery from students who are not only surviving, but thriving despite mental health challenges. This is our very first production made up of all high school students. These incredible students have come together to bring their stories of resilience and hope to the stage because they know their stories have the power to encourage their peers not to give up. It gets better. Help is out there. And by opening up the conversation about mental health through storytelling, we're breaking down those unfair societal pressures that tell us perfection is key. It's okay not to be okay. By sharing our stories, we normalize the fact that our brains get sick sometimes too, and we need to be there for each other by having these real honest conversations about how we're doing. About three weeks ago, I was in Boise, Idaho for our show there. After the last audience member had left the venue, our videographers, Carly and Brayden, a husband-wife team who had filmed all three of our shows in Boise over these years, were packing up their equipment. Before they left, Carly, with tears in her eyes, hugged me and said, Jen, I have no doubt in my mind the work you're doing is changing the world. Then she told me her story. You see, if I've learned anything in the last six years I've been doing this work, it's that when one person shares their story, it gives others the permission to do the same. Brave multiplies brave. Which is why I'm so grateful to you all for being here tonight. Our brave high school cast tonight is joining our community of storytellers from all over the US and Australia who've decided to be brave and put their stories out there. Over 775 of them who have shared their truths on our stages in our 66 shows so far. This is my brave's vision is to get to a place where we no longer have to call it brave for talking openly about mental illness. We should simply call it talking. So please help me and join me in welcoming to the stage the lead producer of This Is My Braves High School Edition pilot, Christine Drexler. My warmest welcome to you for this very first This Is My Brave High School Edition. 
My name again is Christine Drexler, and I'd like to thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart for coming tonight to witness Hershey shine a light on mental health issues. If we, emphasis on we, want to break the stigma, it has to be up to us. We can't wait for somebody else to do it. We, each individually, have the opportunity to do that. One kindness, one act that helps somebody understand that they matter, that their place on this universe is important. Before we get started, though, I wanted to um, take a moment to thank our sponsors. The 2019 season of shows would not be possible without the support of our national sponsors, Janssen, Synovian, Alchemus, and Sage Therapeutics. We would also like to say a special thank you to our local sponsors, Faulkner Subaru, the Jessica Drew Sunshine Memorial Fund, the Hershey Company, Highmark Blue Shield, Penn State Health, the UPS Store, and Hershey Entertainment and Resorts and the MS Hershey Foundation for this amazing venue. Um, <laughs> We are also great, so grateful to the Hershey Library and Country Meadows for hosting our auditions and rehearsals. And thank you to our partner organizations, Someone to Tell It To and Please Live. We appreciate the help of our photographers, Doug um, and Susan, and our videographer, Zach Hursty, in capturing the magic of tonight's show. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Can everyone take out their cell phones? Because I'm sure you all have one. This Is My Brave is a very social organization. And we'd love, actually love, you don't hear this much in the theater, for you to capture um, tonight's event, take lots of pictures, selfies, even video clips. They're all allowed. Share them on your social networks with the hashtag storytelling saves lives. What you are about to experience defines what it means to live brave. We need your help to tell the world we are here, we matter, and they can learn what it means to live brave, too. So share away. Don't be shy. I'm not shy. Our social media team will do their very best to share, retweet, and regram as many posts as possible to help spread the word. We appreciate your help, and now would be a good time to make sure your phone is on silent for the duration of the show. Since This Is My Brave is a storytelling organization, I thought it would make sense to tell you a little bit about my story and how I had the incredible blessing of getting involved with This Is My Brave. And for sure, it has been an incredible blessing and an incredible journey. Um, Mr. Smith, the administrator at the high school, um, contacted me and he said, I've got something that I think might be right up your alley. Can you join me in a, in a meeting? Huh, up my alley for sure. I sat there and I sat there and I was like crawling out of my seat until one of the other administrators looked at me and said, hey Christine, you want to run with this, don't you? I said, I sure do. And so, here we are. Um, I, uh, sorry. Um, I was especially moved, I'm sorry, by Jen's story and her willingness to give back to her high school in such an impactful way. That she would use her story to inspire others to share theirs moved me deeply. When I was younger, my mom was taken away from me for weeks. And I never knew why. Nobody talked about it. Nobody told me why. And years later, I would be told she was suffered from a mental breakdown. My uncle came back from Vietnam and could barely talk about the things that he saw and then he was gone. But again, 
Nobody talked about it. It was suicide. But nobody talked about it. He was just gone. And the truth of the matter is, is that through our most difficult circumstances, we, again we, have the greatest potential to help someone else. Because if we did not have a difficult circumstance, we wouldn't need any help. But we all need help. We can help someone because of where we've been. And that is why storytelling is so important. Because each of us has a story. And tonight, we are preparing to embark on an incredible journey. You will laugh, you will cry. You will be enlightened and you will be inspired. And it is our hope that you will leave tonight with a transformed perception of the invisibleness of mental health illness, thanks to the bravery of these amazing teens. Because this is the reality. One in five American teens is dealing with a diagnosable, diagnosable mental health disorder. Because we do not talk about mental illness enough, often, often, often. They are suffering in silence. That's not okay. This changes today, right here, right now, on this stage. We are shining a light on mental illness to show the world we are your friends, colleagues, classmates, neighbors, and community members. We hope that through our storytelling, you will better understand mental illness and be able to be more supportive to those in your life who may experience it. You may be inspired to share your own story, and I hope you do. It is when we share our stories that we open up the conversation and storytelling saves lives. Please help me now welcome Michael Gingrich and Tom Caden from Someone to Tell It To. Have you ever felt like nobody was there? Have you ever felt forgotten in the middle of nowhere? Have you ever felt like you could disappear, like you could fall and no one would hear? Well, let that lonely feeling wash away. Maybe there's a reason to believe you'll be okay. Cause when you don't feel strong enough to stand, you can reach, reach out your hand. These lyrics from the multi-award-winning Broadway musical, Dear Evan Hansen, about a teenage boy living with severe social anxiety brings to light some of the struggles that so many of us live with every single day. That's what tonight is about, bringing to light the struggles, the journeys, the fears, the loneliness, the pain. It's what Someone to Tell To, the nonprofit mission that we started and co-founded, is all about. Giving anyone who needs to tell their story the safety and the space to bring it into the light. We offer the security and the sanctuary for him to be vulnerable and honest and open so that the darkness is no longer a threat. That's what tonight is all about. Several years ago, I was in a play, and when I first walked on the stage for the play, I was supposed to walk out in complete darkness to the very edge of the stage. We practiced for months, you know, in, a, in church basements and, and other places in, in the light, and there was no darkness. But two nights before the play began, when we had the technical rehearsal and with the lighting and costumes and, and everything else, when I first walked out on the stage, I couldn't see a thing. And I walked as close as I thought I could to the edge, but I couldn't see it, and I was afraid I was going to fall off. After that rehearsal, the director asked me how I felt about it. 
And I said I couldn't see, and I was afraid. I was afraid of the darkness. And so he said, we can fix that. So he said, instead of you walking out in complete darkness, when you come out, we will shine a spotlight. All you need to do is walk into the light. And as long as you stay in the light, you will not fall off the stage. And that's what I did. And I didn't fall off. So, even when the dark comes crashing through, when you need a friend to carry you, and when you're broken on the ground, you will be found tonight. May everyone here who is walking into the darkness, afraid of falling off the edge, finally be able to step instead into the light and stay there because you are not alone. And because of the light, there is a reason, there is a reason to believe that you will be okay. So, it is our privilege, our pleasure, to welcome tonight our featured storytellers who are brave, who are walking from the darkness into the light to share their lives. Thank you. My name is Erin, and this piece is called The Worry List. I wrote this um, three years ago in 2016, following the death of my son by suicide. I want to be completely honest with you, because I want you to be completely honest with yourselves. I never, ever thought that I would lose a child to suicide. It wasn't a possibility. It was never on my worry list. And it's not like I was a mom who didn't have a worry list. I did. It was extensive. I worried about everything. I worried about SIDS and falls and head injuries and abduction, illnesses like meningitis and flu, school shootings, terrorist attacks, I could go on and on. Suicide just wasn't a consideration. That was something that other families had to worry about. Does that sound familiar? How about this? At back to school night several years ago, the health and PE teachers announced that one entire unit in the ninth grade would now be dedicated to mental health. I was so glad to hear that. That is such an important addition to the curriculum. There are kids out there who will really benefit from that, I thought to myself, smugly. Or on the occasion that my kids would come off the bus and tell me they'd seen on Twitter that a student at a nearby school had died from suicide. I'd be so sad for that student, for that family. But then they would add these details that seemed to explain things. They'd say, he was always in trouble, or I heard his girlfriend just broke up with him, or she'd attempted before. Oh, I see. As if, what, it all made sense then? No, certainly not. But those explanations gave me reasonable justification to file those stories away far, far away from my worry list, in a drawer that I labeled other people's problems, in a folder marked, too bad. Isn't this how we protect ourselves? 
It's pretty clear from that list that I could find any reason as a mom to worry. So if there was one thing that I could strike from that list, wouldn't I be better off? So I reassured myself with one of the most self-righteous things a parent can say. I said to myself, my kids would never do that. And then I followed it up with, that will never happen to us. And yet, here I stand. I lost a child to suicide. And in Jay's case, there's just no simple explanation for his death. He wasn't always in trouble. His girlfriend didn't just break up with him. He hadn't attempted before. In fact, he was a pretty cool kid. He was smart and funny and active in school. He was part of the varsity golf team. He was in the improv group in the engineering club. He was applying to college. He'd just gotten his permit to operate, his learner's permit to operate a motorcycle and was hoping that his dad and I would buy him one for graduation. So his death was a complete shock to us and to our community. So since we can't f just file his situation away into that too bad category, I think it's important that we take a look at the facts. Recent studies suggest for teenagers in America today, the risk of death by suicide is now nearly equal to the risk of death by car accident. Equal. The scary piece of that is that the mortality rate for car accidents is going down. The mortality rate for suicides is going up. The two are about to meet at this critical point of 13 deaths for every 100,000 people. Where will we go from here? I didn't know this information four years ago. I really wish I did. But I'm here telling you now. Please consider it and consider this. For all the time that we spend preparing our kids to safely operate a car down the road, in Pennsylvania, it's 90 hours of practice that is required of them before they can be licensed. For all that time that we spend grilling them, what what will you do if a deer runs out in front of you? What will you do if your tire dips off the pavement? What will you do if you feel yourself hydroplaning? For all that time that we spend, according to those statistics, shouldn't we spend at least an equal amount of time talking to them about their mental health? Prepare your kids for the fact that their bodies are changing, their brains are changing at a very fast rate. That transition through adolescence into adulthood, it can go smoothly or it can result in some challenges. Imagine what some of those might look like and then suggest appropriate responses. You can tell your kids, you're surrounded by people who love you, and yet you may feel lonely inside. You may have a sense of emptiness, hopelessness, or helplessness. If you ever feel this way, please tell me, tell us. It's important to say, I don't feel like myself. I think I need some help. Tell your kids, you may walk around with a knot in your stomach, but when you look around, you can't see anything that's causing you anxiety. Tell your kids if you ever feel like that, it's important to say something. You can say, I don't feel like myself. I think I need some help. Your kids may notice that they are not doing things that they once enjoyed. Maybe their friends are texting and they're avoiding going out with them. Maybe they always love to go to football games on a Friday night and now they're skipping those. There's no good explanation, but tell them if they ever sense that they are not enjoying things that they once enjoyed, that they should say something. They can say, I don't feel like myself. I don't know what it is, but I think I need some help. 
Start the conversation and revisit it often, just in case. Prepare yourself for the po and your kids for the possibility of mental anguish and equip them with words to say should they ever notice that it's happening. In so doing, you normalize mental illness, you acknowledge it's a possibility, and you have a plan to manage it. Now, I'm not saying that all mental illness can be swept away in a few short conversations. I recognize that there are conditions that are extremely difficult to manage and overcome. But there is little chance that we will ever make progress in reducing those alarming suicide statistics if kids and families are unprepared to acknowledge a struggle or if they actively seek to hide their struggles out of fear or confusion or shame. So please, start the conversations that will bring this all out in the open. Please, put suicide on your worry list and then do everything you can to make sure that it never touches your family. Thank you. Our first student performer this evening is actually coming to us video via video. Um, this is Joe Perry. He performed this past Sunday in Columbus, Ohio, and we loved his performance so much that we prepared a piece for you tonight so you could enjoy it as well. Hello. What is up? Hi everyone, I'm Joe Perry. I'm 16 and I'm from Gehanna, Ohio, a suburb of Columbus. I like to rock climb. I like to fish. I like to cook. And I suppose the elephant in the room is why I'm here is I battle mental illness. Since I was around 13, I have battled Firstly with ADD, that was followed with anxiety and depression. I was hospitalized a few times. It's been a journey and I'm not quite out of the woods yet. A good day is a day that I get through without deciding that I don't want to do anything, without shutting down from an anxiety attack. I might be happy, I might be sad, but it's reasonable. And a bad day is the opposite of that. I can't function. I don't want to function. We don't talk about this type of thing. A lot of people, we're afraid, won't understand or they'll think we're crazy. It's really tough to overcome that idea of I'm going to be judged for this. I tried out for This Is My Brave because I initially just wanted a way to get my poetry out there. And the more I got into it, the more I realized this was a good way to get out my message of ending the stigma surrounding mental illness. If I hadn't talked about it, I wouldn't be sitting here. If we don't talk about it, the amount of shine the world loses from the people who don't see the shine in themselves because it's being dimmed by their mental illness is so dramatic. It is my exquisite pleasure to introduce Joe Perry. I am going to be reading two poems today, and I know what you're thinking, oh God, another poet, but just <laughs> deal with it, okay. The first one is called This Is Me, and the second is called Chameleon. This is me. I want to leave my mark, slay some beast, create some masterpiece, but I can't do this. 
So what can I do? And what am I to do? And what am I waiting for? I need to go. I need to show these demons that I know. I know all of their tricks of despair. I've lived them. I know all of the forms of misery. I've felt them. That even when I feel condemned, I am not. I know it sounds cliche, but I can bust down the gates, show everyone what I've got, that what I've got shines like a ray of sun on a land of sadness, a beam of hope in my mind consumed by madness. I've always had this, I just never knew it or knew how to use it. I'm still kind of new to this whole hope thing. It's been a long road. It's a dark path. It's been cold, but I've made it past, and I will continue, continue to fight against the darkness and against the night, against the hourglass, each grain of sand, a piece of sanity slowly slipping away from me. Look at my journey. That's what will define me. I am my mark on this world. This is me. From my skin to my guts, my toes to my brain, all the blemishes and cuts, and I may be slightly insane, but I'm still human, just like you and your best friend. I'll let the world see me, but only I will see what's going on inside, the hidden, or the things that go on inside my head, and that's where things get interesting. Inside of my head is a whirlwind, flying thoughts, flying emotions, all mixed together, incoherent. It moves fast. Try to keep up. It's hard. I know. I've had to fight this my whole life. Happy, sad, this, that, some random facts. It all spins around. It brings me to my knees. These, these are the things that define me to me. It drives me crazy, but this is who I am. Chameleon. What does mental illness look like? No, there's a better question. What does it look like in me, or in you, or in anyone else? Because I'll tell you right now, it's not the same in everyone. And I know I'm younger than some of you, and I know I'm older than another few, and I don't know what you're all going through, or who you even are, for that matter. Just that you care enough to come here, I think that's pretty cool. So without further ado, Let's talk about why I think mental illness is a chameleon. I'll give you a few examples. Here's my story. We won't start where it, end, where it begins. We'll start where it almost ends. I'll paint the picture. A picture of a 16-year-old boy. Everything is going right for this guy. Then he tries to take his life a few times. I know you're either asking why or assuming, so I'll tell you. I thought this world was nothing but rot with pain and strife. I fought every day to see a light, to have a reason to stay alive, to keep living. I was clinging on to anything and everything, but in the end I found nothing. I was blind. There was stuff there to find, but a curtain had descended, and it's only now just lifting. And I know this is a lot of information for you to be sifting through. But I'm going to jump back. Back to a different time and a younger age. Back to the seventh grade. I had fallen into a haze, recently diagnosed with ADD. I still didn't know what this meant for me. The world started to seem bleak, and I'll spare you the details, but let's just say that it left a few scars, and it left my mind slightly ajar. I was different. But then for a while, I was better. That's the thing about these diseases. They like to sneak up on you. When you're weak, when you're strong, when you're right, when you're wrong, up and to the point where it all becomes unbearable and you snap until you're lying flat on the bathroom floor while your parents race to unlock the door. It isn't fun. I never asked for this. I don't deserve this. I just wish no one else goes through it because I never got the help I needed. I never reached out and said I bleed out and cry and ask this guy, why me? Why can't I succeed or see recovery? But I know why. It's this thing in my mind. It has me giving up on myself. I need to stand up for myself. And I need to stand up to myself. And it's hard. And the road is dark. But I have hope. And that alone gives me a reason to fight. Fight this horrid disease. But that's just what it looks like in me. Mental illness is a chameleon, a reptilian, cold-blooded piece of shit. I'm so sick of it, sick of feeling sick, of feeling like I need to stick a knife into my wrists. I need a pinch or a flick, because this must just be a nightmare. Or maybe it's just one of those nights where I need to be with someone, because I don't know if I'm safe or what I'd do if I was alone. But that's just me. It has many ugly heads, it chooses which to rear. I knew a girl who battled an eating disorder, 
and I say I would have done anything in the world to help her fight through it, but the truth is I was useless. I had no clue this was going on. Beneath her smile, her illness, like mine, knew how to hide. I knew a guy with incredible love. He loved this one girl, and by that he was undone. She didn't love him, so mental illness told him to stop loving himself. So he put himself through hell, but he did so silently. And it was months before anyone found out, almost too late for him. You see, we all know a guy or a girl. Maybe they're close, maybe they're not, but that's not the point. We all know what it looks like. We just don't know that we know. And it's what we don't know that hurts us. So let's turn the page. Let's make a change. We all need to agree to wage a full-out assault on while these diseases. Don't just Fight it while we're alive. Dead. Don't just mourn us while we're dead. We need to start at the beginning, not at the, not at the end. How to and the first step is knowing chameleon. how to spot Thank you. a chameleon. Thank you. Next, please help me welcome Neha Sinha, singer, songwriter. last year and I'm so excited to be working with this incredible organization again. I'm a strong advocate for mental health and I struggle with depression. I've been struggling with it since I was only 11 years old but it took me a long time to realize what it was and to reach out for help. During middle school it was at the worst point it's ever been. I was constantly sad, constantly hopeless and I didn't see a way out. But worst of all I didn't know what was wrong. I thought I was crazy and thought that no one would believe me. So I turned to the one thing I knew couldn't judge me, music. I began writing down everything I was feeling and turning it into lyrics and melodies, and it set me free. I was finally able to express everything that I had been feeling, and it saved me. The song I'm gonna be singing for you today is called Safe. I wrote it as a letter to myself, and it sort of reflects on everything I went through. I hope you like it.
4 a.m. and I'm wide awake. I was just singing these words to you, but I'm just singing to a mirror. Cause I need myself to know that I'm today, I can promise you my journey with depression was anything but poetic. It was mostly sleepless nights, losing my will to live, and pretending I was mentally stable just so I could avoid the relentless question, are you okay? Well, I'm not okay, but I'm brave. Today, I'll be sharing a piece with you called Little Do You Know, and this is my brave. Many of you probably would never assume this about me, but I suffer from depression. Yes, sometimes I tend to carry a smile so bright that I almost seem unbreakable. But behind that smile is a girl trying to make peace with her broken pieces. So she keeps smiling, but it's all just a show. My favorite thing to do in the world is acting when I was younger, I dreamed of being an actress for a living. Today, I found my dream come true, but not in the way I planned. In the theater, I've taken on numerous roles, but none compared to the one I played every day. I got so into my character that those around me actually thought they knew me. But little do they know, I'm a child of a struggling single mother. Little did they know, if I could be granted one wish right now, I'd wish for my brother. Little did they know, I'm a girl that continues to grow up without the love of a father. Little did they know, I would tell them all this, but I hate to be a bother. Little did they know, I'm a girl that can still feel the weight of sticky notes written with hurtful words on her back. Little do they know those notes create long-lasting insecurities. So until this day, I try to make up for what I lack. And because you will never know what I feel, you think my depression isn't real. Just like how you think racism isn't real because you never experienced it. Just like how you think dreams can't become real because Yours have it come true? Just like how you think a solution to our world's problems isn't real. But here's the deal. Little do you know, you're living in a show. A man once said, give them bread and circuses and they will never revolt. So is that why society puts issues like racism to a halt? We blame society, but we are society. So don't act if it isn't your fault. Do you know while you're at home watching Adele accept her Grammy, our president is separating a child from their family? Why is it that you can tell me the brand name of the shoes Kim Kardashian wears, but you can't tell me why a man killed himself and nobody seems to care? Could it just be that you don't want to face reality? Noted. You're used to your new sugar coated, so how about this? Roses are red, fruit is savory, the US prison system is basically legalized slavery. Was that sweet enough for you to digest? Would you like to hear me finish the rest? See, as you dance around the situation, you affect what will one day be our future generation. Grades are getting low, teens are getting high, a 12-year-old is pregnant and her parents wonder, why? Who isn't faded these days? Teens are sending nudes, 
Kids are getting beaten. Teachers see the bruises. No calls for help are spoken. Teens are smoking weed. Young girls are cutting. This isn't what we need. A little girl has killed herself. Nobody seems to care. Another kid has been expelled for a stupid dare. But it needs to change. Our world is officially broken. It's time to take a stand. Your thoughts need to be spoken. This morning, I got up, got ready, looked in the mirror and decided, despite what I've been told over the years, I'm not ugly. But society, it is. I also decided that it was okay that I'm broken because so is the world. Beautiful mosaics are made of broken pieces. I am one broken piece, part of a beautiful world. I impact the world, but I don't shape it. Granted, I'm an 18 year old girl. I haven't seen most of the world and the most of the world hasn't seen me. I don't walk on water, but I like to think the man that did gave me a gift. This gift to somehow change someone in just three to five minutes. Open the minds of the most closed-minded people to inform and educate with simple words. My words. There's so much we don't know about our world or let alone each other. After all, before this speech, many of you thought you knew me. There now may be many things you question about me, like why do I do this every year? Well, I can tell you it's not for the money or the fame. So I can take part in raising a generation that knows this is the world they're living in and they shape every fragment of it. It took me a long time to develop a voice and now that I have it, I'm not gonna be silent. So I encourage you to use your voice. I encourage you to stand up for what you believe in, even if you're standing alone. I encourage you to raise your words, not your voice. Because in an empty field, it is the rain that grows the flowers, not the thunder. Wow. Can we hear another round of applause for these amazing... I am one. Just one. And one can only do this much. But two, and three, and four, and on and on. When they join together, they become better, and they become a force to be reckoned with. For the last months, I have had the incredible joy um, of, of working on this project, but it doesn't take just one person. So. I would like to thank tonight my incredible, incredible team. Um, Kim McCall, Leanne Easterwood, Susan Court, Anne-Marie Schuper, Lori Shearer, Stacy Wisniewski, and Trish Fisher. They poured in and poured in and poured in some more and I could not have done it without them. We truly are better together. But... <laughs> Months of rehearsals, lots of laughing, lots of crying, 
lots of amazingness. And that is what is about to come your way. We are on a journey and we are each on a different journey. And maybe you're able to be on stage and maybe you're able to be in the audience. Maybe you want to talk, maybe you don't. But you have a story and you have a journey. And I have had the great pleasure to work with these incredible young people who have something to share that is theirs and theirs alone and something to share because of where they've been, what their story is, and what is ahead. This is just one step, but I could not be more proud to introduce to you this evening our storytellers. Hi. I'm Maddie Ebert, and this is my brave. It is important to share our stories because at some point in our lives, we all feel alone. We all feel like the feelings we keep inside we're the only ones who feel them. It is so difficult to describe the thoughts and feelings going on inside our heads and in our hearts and keeping it inside to ourselves because we feel we will be misunderstood and pushed away is detrimental to our health. It is essential to share our stories so that others can hear us and realize that they're not alone. It leads to us being able to say, yes, that is exactly how I feel making diagnosis easier and bringing the road to recovery right in front of us. The stories may all be different, all our experiences may be different, but in the end, we all feel the same way in one aspect. We want to feel better. We all want to be happy and enjoy life. In my past, I've struggled with depression, anxiety, panic disorder, OCD, I personally know how incredibly painful it is and how it seems like it won't get better, but it will. By telling our stories, even as I just did, we help others come closer to being healthy and happy, and even sometimes do the same for ourselves, just by knowing we're helping those who hear. Not only the people who are struggling and battling, but the people who love and care for them and just want to make it better with the snap of a finger. It may be hard, but we all have the ability to get better with the help of others and their knowledge. We are all different and all unique, but we're all brought together by our stories and battles, the want and need to be happy and to overcome whatever obstacles in front of us. Everyone has a story. What's yours? My name is Maddie Maduri and this is my brave. After struggling with diagnoses for the past couple years, um, I've been diagnosed with anxiety disorder, panic disorder, PS PSTD, PTSD, and um, depression, but um, my main struggle has been with bipolar 2 disorder. And the piece I'm about to read to you is an original poem about my journey with diagnoses and recovery. Then it happened, a place that I dreaded for weeks in partial, I knew where I was headed. I never knew how I'd feel, my mood switched constantly, I could be smiling one minute and the next, I'm drowning. I'd be mad for no reason and forget the things I'd say. I'd move on without thinking, but my family wasn't okay. I did a lot of bad things, things I wouldn't do now because I couldn't see past my transient frown. I talked to the doctor there and he couldn't figure me out. Then he heard the things I'd done and he knew without a doubt. He said, I think you're bipolar, but I'm not sure. I said I couldn't be, keep looking for more, for more. Turns out I'm bipolar, only type two, but I couldn't accept it or that makes it true. I was scared people would think I was crazy because stereotypes made my understanding hazy. I cried for an hour after hearing this news. I was so upset and I didn't know what to do. Doctors prescribed things that didn't come close to working until they found something while they were searching. 
The meds that they gave me made me so sick. I did some gene testing, which explained why they didn't do the trick. I'd swallowed their new pill and it was starting to help, but I'd swallowed so many, how could I tell? I'd been taking it for a year and it had done a lot. My feeling of crazy had started to rot. So here I am. But I'm scared and I'm weary because I believe that happiness is temporary. And I'm worried that this feeling of okay is fleeting. In my past, it only lasts for a day. I've accepted it, the diagnosis I didn't want, and it's a part of me now, so it no longer haunts me. I feel like I lost myself in this process of healing, but I didn't. I'm just struggling to find my meaning. But here I am, and I'm doing just fine, and I'm starting to have faith that it's real this time. I've proved to myself that I'm stronger than I think, but so many times I wondered if a drink would help. I've got a good job now and friends to match, and I'm just hoping that this time it lasts. I want you to know that it took a long, a long time. Lots of people were needed to make me feel fine. I'm still pushing through. It'll never be easy, but I'm stable now. So let's hope life is breezy. I didn't think I would make it a year even two, but I did, and here's what I have to say to you. It's okay to be anxious, it's okay to be sad, it's okay to be depressed and it's okay to be mad, it's okay to have feelings and to struggle with them too. Just know that you're stronger and you can push through. It takes some time, a lot actually, to see if therapy or meds are helping. So don't give up, the journey is long, and don't ever forget where you came from. It'll be cloudy, the road isn't clear, but don't lose yourself amongst all your fears. Stick to your roots and keep people close, the ones that really love you, the ones that know the most. You might change, and you probably will, but that doesn't mean who you are has been killed. I promise you're still there with a little bit added. A little reshaping was all that really happened. One day you'll feel it, just like I did too, the moment you realize you've always been you. Hi, I'm Cohen Stover, and this is My Brave. Being a senior of the cross-country team and a senior in school at Hershey High School, I strive to be friends with as many people as I can. This fall, I tried to get close with all of my fellow teammates on the Hershey cross-country team, but one stuck out. Four weeks ago, we had our conference meet. I found out that me and this individual would have to race each other for that last postseason spot. Before the race, that morning, I was crying, not because I was nervous about beating him, but because I knew that was the last time I got to race with him. While the others danced around, had fun, were ready to run that day, me and my friend were sitting in the tent, not wanting to, not wanting to run. The moral of this story is we need to be aware of the people that are hurting. Just because you think you're fine, or you're having a great day, or you think you're always having a great day, doesn't mean those around you aren't having a great day. A simple pat on the back, a simple, hey, how are you doing, will go the longest way possible. We need to pay attention. Thank you. I'm Katie Stover. I'm Sophia Stolabrink. I'm Kaylee Wong. And this, and this is, is our brave. My name is Sky Byram and this is my brave. I've been coping both positively and negatively with my mental health issues since I was 13. I've been diagnosed with major depressive disorder, PTSD, and a generalized anxiety disorder among others. Significant causes of my mental decline were bullying, my father abandoning me, and an abusive ex-stepfather. I've been called crazy and a freak among other things. I don't know how many, 
how many times. Hell, just today in the hallway, somebody told me to kill myself. Those words used to wear on me, make me feel bad or different. But eventually it got to the point where I said, enough. Your words don't faze me. Yes, they hurt, but they don't define me. They don't define any of us unless we let them. We can't be defined by mere words. We are too unique and we won't change to please you. Many people think of depression as sadness, but it's so much more to me, to those suffering. For me, it was feeling alone, unheard, numb, and every emotion all at once. Pretty confusing, right? Other times, it was crippling grief and no will to live. I resorted to self-harm and attempted on my life. I'm not proud of my scars, but I will not be ashamed of them anymore. I won't hide them. Depression and self-harm doesn't define me anymore because I am not my illness and neither are you. My name is Trent Burkheiser and this is my brave. I got diagnosed with ADHD when I was like three or four. I also had a speech delay when I was younger. I got bullied for my speech delay because I said words not correctly. Uh, I didn't think of anything of it. I just thought that was normal, but no, it was not normal. People also bullied me because I'm skinny and have a connective tissue disorder. Uh, also, the last year and a half has been really hard for me. Uh, my mom and my dad has had some marriageable struggles that has made me really hurt and depressed. I haven't know I don't know how to deal with it. I used to be strong but now I've kind of fallen apart. I just hope that no one else has to go through what I have. We all have people that suffer, but we all need to be strong. I will be strong and I will fight for what I believe in. Hi, my name is Rayvon Williamson, and this is my brave. I'm Alexis Bell, and this is my brave. In the suicide prevention posters at school, the people are shown as a stereotypical emo person with dark hair, bangs that cover their eyes, and dark makeup. In reality, a person with mental health could be the happy and popular girl who is surrounded by friends, the preppy guy who seemingly has no problems, the jocks that names are cheered at their games, the musical people with smiles and laughs as they sing, and any other person that comes to mind. It could be anyone you know and you wouldn't even realize it, because when mental health comes to mind, you hold a specific image. Kids this day and age are amazing at hiding how they feel because they don't want to get judged for their problems. When in reality, it needs to be shown that it is normal to have anxiety or depression or any type of mental health condition there is. There should not be an image of depression. There should not be an image of mental health because in most cases, the people that are struggling the most are the ones surrounded by people and laughing through their pain. Instead of looking at their outer image, listen to their laugh, watch their smile, and pay attention to them when they're alone. Because most likely, that's when you'll be able to see the truth, their truth. Hello, um, my name is Fei Lin, and this is my brave. As an international student from China, I jumped out of my comfort zone and joined a totally unknown family in an unfamiliar country. I was not mentally prepared for this with my 16 years of life experience. I was, I was not confident with my English. I didn't dare to talk to people. Even now, I, I was hesitating um, to start a conversation with others. In this, con in this condition, I doubted myself. I uh, hesitated to do anything, and I isolated myself. Um, I'm sorry. 
um, um, I, I felt people would never understand what I was going through. However, I found people who love me and support me, and I found a religion that guides through my way. I made a decision that I'm gonna do something with my life. I started working on my personal interests of filmmaking. I made a short film uh, with the school uh, with with the kids in my school. Uh, the, short the short film is about loneliness, and now I'm ready to fundraise for the uh, short film to help out with more people. So now I'm standing here and telling you my story because I want to stand here with everyone who has struggled or is struggling with mental health condition. Um, I want everybody, everyone to know that if you're struggling through a uh, mental health condition, I'm standing here and I'm here with you. Hi everyone, my name is Regan. I'm here to tell you a bit about my battle. It all started when I was in ninth grade. I gained this inner hatred toward myself that I have to fight every day. The voices in my head I need to knock out, telling me I'm not good enough, I should give up, I don't deserve love, I don't deserve fuel, I don't deserve happiness, etc. I've come to terms that those thoughts are coming from my inner demon. They are not me. I would be lying if I told you it was easy to work through. I'm 21 years old and I still struggle every day. Although I've never been happier with the person I've become, I can't say that life is sunshines and rainbows because, well, it's life. But I can tell you, it gets a hell of a lot easier. I keep fighting every day for the ones I love, including myself. I've improved in so many aspects of my life within the past few years because I never and never will give up. I am so thankful for the opportunities I have received from my biggest influencers in my career. As hard as it feels to ask for help, it shows the strength you have inside of you and the passion you have for life. I want to thank my family, my therapist, and my nutritionist for never giving up on me. I also want to thank Puff and Steph for introducing me to my passion and supporting me through the ups and downs. And I also want to thank my boyfriend, Tony, for accepting me for the person I truly am today. I would not be here today without them, and I am so thankful for that. Hi, my name is Charles McCall, and this is my brave. Hi, my name is Kate Emmerich, and this is my brave. When we are born, we sign life's terms and conditions agreement, blindly penning our souls away without even reading it, forfeiting our dreams for a chance at life, then realizing our mistake, trying to fight what was really in the fine print between the fine lines that explained that choice was just a lie. And the sooner we accept that, the happier we'll be. But in this world, is happiness key? Some say it's the journey, not the destination, but others decline, not giving in to the temptation of accepting the sad truth that our journey will leave us begging for redemption. But maybe this isn't what we have to accept. Maybe it's just life's, er, sorry. maybe it's just a trick question on life's big test. The one that everyone thought was right, but isn't sure if it's really the truth or just a guess. Or if it's a question that can only be answered by those experienced. My name is Devlin McCoy, and this is my brave. I was raised in a military family, moving way too often. I never had any true friends until we actually settled down in New York. And even then, I was bullied and tormented constantly. 
I was seen as obese, too sensitive, too feminine, too nerdy. So little seven-year-old me got caught up in his head a lot. I would overthink everything and get really anxious really fast. I would get so depressed and morose to the point I would drown my sorrows in food. I thought the only way the feelings would go away was to stuff my throat with food. I knew that it wasn't right. I really shouldn't have eaten that much. So the guilt built up so much and I started gagging myself and hurling it back up. It was a horrible cycle of eating way too much and puking it out again and again and again. It was a never-ending never ending hell for about three years. But I slowly recovered, recovered when I moved to PA. I got the help that I needed for my binge eating disorder and my bulimia with therapy, medication, proper friend group, and an amazing family. I now live in my own house that my family owns with our own money, and I could not be more grateful. I live with my two beautiful dogs, my parents, and my grandmother. I still struggle here and there, but I've gotten so much better. So to everyone hearing this story, just know that not all scars are visible. And men can suffer from mental problems just as much as women do. Things will always get better. Because if you or someone you love has hit rock bottom, the only way to go is upwards. My name is Aurika Tian, and this is my brave. Sorry, I'm a little short. Hi, I'm Morgan King, and this is my brave. When I was asked to write a piece, I didn't know what to do, so I did what I do when I procrastinate. I watched Game of Thrones before they ruined it and killed my favorite character. <laughs> yeah, you guys know who I'm talking about. Wasn't cool, but it's okay. So there's this line from Sansa Stark where she says, um, after the, I can't spoil it. Well, it's been a few years. After her parents die, sorry. Where it says, from porcelain to ivory to steel. And that really resonated with me because when I was younger, I was 10 and I had my innocence stolen away. I was scared and I couldn't stop her, but I was broken. I was a doll who was made to be perfect, who was made to be happy, and how could I let my mom and dad know that their doll was shattered and that porcelain had broken? So I decided, no, I'm a lion, I'm a king, that's our symbol, I will grow, I'll be strong. So I changed and I became ivory, but I didn't know that like an elephant, my ivory was gonna be poached. I traded bullies for fake friends, horrible things for even worse things, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to cope because I still saw that 10-year-old girl in the mirror staring back at me, her eyes wide, begging me to say anything, and I couldn't. So I decided, what's one pill? What's two? Soon 10. But I didn't feel better. I didn't want to feel better. I just wanted to be broken because that's all I knew. And the only thing that made me change that night was when I heard my mom and dad crying in the room, begging to a God that I completely forgot for change, for their little girl to be okay. So I started to change to steel. And for anybody who knows anything about steel, it takes a really long time. You know, it's not like, oh, there's some steel. It's not Minecraft. So it took a long time. It took coming clean to my parents about the trauma I faced. It took slowly moving from friend groups to places I felt okay. It took therapists and doctors and a hell of a lot of time. It was not quick. But I finally saw myself in the mirror and what I would give to tell that 10-year-old girl it's not your fault what she did or to tell that 13-year-old made of ivory put down the bottle. But I've come to terms that I can't. I'm me now. I'm Morgan King. I'm only a few inches taller than when I was 10, but that's okay because I feel 10 feet tall because I changed from porcelain to ivory to steel. Hi, my 
name is Jacob Drexler and this is my brave. I think a lot of things that happen with mental health is we are truly uneducated on the topic itself. Sometimes in school we're afraid to talk about it because we don't know what everyone is going through. We all are different in our story and I was so happy when I heard Erin speak and she said that there was a mental health unit going into their health class because that's what I wanted to talk about is because that's what I would like to see. I would like to see implemented in our schools ways that they're kind of showing that they're here for us and they're supporting and something that really lit me up is I, as I looked across the crowd as I was coming down, I saw so many of my past and present school teachers sitting in the audience and when that tells me is that they're there, they're here for me and they're willing to support me and all the other students standing up here because they care. And that is so amazing to see because we're, we are all in this together. So what I hope is implemented is that there's a unit where we're not afraid to talk about what we're struggling and we can be brave and we can all share because you never know when there's someone else in that room afraid to talk until they hear someone else saying, yes, that's what I struggle with too. I do not want mental health to be something we are afraid to talk about anymore. My name is Guinevere, and this is my brave. It's a little difficult, but I see you. I see you sitting in the audience. I see you watching us and absorbing all of this amazing information and sad information that we're giving you. You're real. This wall that you feel between yourself and the rest of the world, it's not real. It's valid that you feel it because I feel it sometimes too, but it's not blocking us from you. All of the pain and suffering and even mild discomfort that you are feeling is real, but you're not broken. There's nothing wrong with you. You're still here. And that's the most important thing. So don't stay silent any longer. Reach out. Ask for help. Because you deserve so much more. You deserve better. You deserve life. Because this is our brave. 